Oh, okay, so I have to pretend that I yeah. never saw you yeah, guys you before. Sure. Uh, I was a working class kid, and I left a very parochial education. 56 girls in a menopausal nun in one classroom. We're back to, did I ever turn? <laughs> hey, just consciously try to turn. the same person to that the same <laughs> interview. Right, that's what it is. <laughs> right. Um, leave the subtext. Yes, I think I have um, tried to change my accent frequently and continually. And I can't tell whether that's a character flaw or a personality trait uh, or survival, but, but yes, I have. Um, the most specific time that I remember is leaving the sixth grade, I was 12, going into uh, the public Latin school in Boston. And I came from 56 girls and a menopausal nun in South Boston and um, very decidedly tried to clean up my grammar. I don't think I thought so much of an accent. We sounded pretty much alike in terms of our A's and R's idea. And Kennedy was in the White House. Uh, we were getting a lot of approval for that. Um, a lot of our teachers were Irish or Yankee, so it wasn't that, but grammar and idioms and that sort of thing definitely tried to, to change then. Um, and when I left Latin school and went to Wellesley and people tried to change my accent and make it more homogeneous and I don't know whether they were threatened by it or I sounded so Irish Catholic, uh, then I made a conscious effort to retain the broad A and to retain putting an R where it shouldn't be uh, and sort of going overboard that way, so I think that's conscious. And then through my married life, when I've caught New Yorkisms that I've picked up from my husband, um, I've tried to bleach them out. And then sometimes I do sort of a, a shtick when I try to adapt a New York accent. So yes, I think frequently I've played around with my accent. Um, when you say consciously, um, I wish it were more conscious. I think that it depends on the mood and depends on the person. And um, maybe I should start thinking of that consciously. Sometimes it was for survival. Uh, when I was a teenager, it was definitely for survival. Uh, teenagers can be cruel when someone isn't sounding like them. And it was definitely a class issue. There was the other issue uh, coming home from Latin school back to South Boston, going the other way, where I was so re sounding la di da. Uh, I don't remember correcting my parents' grammar, uh, but I must have at some point. I remember my father saying to my mother one time, we've, we've made a Frankenstein. We sent her to Latin school and we made a Frankenstein. And there was a lot of ambivalence about sending a child to Latin school. I mean, my mother used to say, the best thing about growing up in South Boston is it takes a dime to get out. Uh, but of course, once you get out, you sounded different. And in a family with a lot of talkers, and where we loved to talk, and a lot of oral history, I mean, we relived World War II nightly. I knew who Fred Allen was when I was six, and you know, he was on, off the radio a while. Um, that talking, when I sounded different from them, I think they were both proud and upset. I, as I said, I don't remember correcting their grammar. I remember in later years, by the time I got to college, consciously not correcting their grammar so as not to hurt their feelings. So I think I must have gone through earlier correcting their grammar and maybe arguing about it. Or my mother, who was an avid reader but didn't talk to women who read, or, or men, but mostly women, uh, who read The New Yorker as she did, would say things like orgy or epitome. And um, she was in her 30s, a high school graduate. And um, that would bother me, and I would be hurt for her, but I never bothered to correct her about it. I didn't want to get into the argument. But I think also I thought, she's never going to be in any place where anyone's going to, <laughs> anyone's going to bother to correct her. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean that, that when, so, so if you went to, to Boston Latin School, uh, and there was pressure to change, does that mean there were, there were different sorts of Boston accents? Absolutely. Um, there was a black Boston accent that we didn't hear too much of because we didn't have too many blacks. Um, that was a very self-conscious accent. Um, Toni Morrison talks about that in The Bluest Eye, the ladies who put vanilla behind their ears. Uh, was very cautious and careful. And I remember those young women not having very much to say in class. My guess is now, looking back, um, and having graduated with a few of them, um, one who went to MIT and just did very well through Latin school. Um, they must have had a different language uh, at home and a different language when they left Latin school. 
there was a Chinese community and they spoke Chinese at home. There was the North End, uh, and many of those girls were very bright on paper, but sounded terrible. They sounded um, like Brooklyn. Or we used to say among each other, as teenagers, they sounded like the Mafia. Um, they sounded like a bad Italian movie to us. Uh, and then there was a Kevin White uh, accent, a West Roxbury, Jamaica Plain. In South Boston, we used to call it a two-toilet Irish um, accent, because they had two toilets. Um, I said that once to someone um, that uh, I had moved from South Boston to Brookline, and now I was the two-toilet Irish. And I said, I understand it was priest. I said, I understand, Father, you're from Somerville. And I said, uh, that, is that the one-toilet Irish? And he said, no, just indoors. <laughs> I was, but yes, there was that. There was that accent, that Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury accent. The, pa the parents of those children were school teachers and college educated, and I didn't know anyone who went to college by his or her first name until I graduated from college myself. So I never thought of it as being different accents, but rather simply good grammar. Um, they sounded brighter. They had a, a larger vocabulary. And they didn't have those idioms that I, I used to say, um, he goes, I went to the store, she goes, what did you get? That kind of stuff. I shared those idioms with some of the kids from the North End. And our fathers, well, my father was a firefighter. Um, and other fathers were cab drivers or waiters or, or um, less powerful people in society. So I associated that with people. Few lawyers' children, few teachers' children. Not, not big money in the public Latin school. What about nowadays? Are there, do they still have uh, you know, different neighborhood accents and, and class-related accents in Boston, in, in the area? Absolutely. Absolutely. My husband says, my husband occasionally takes a sauna at the L Street Bath. And um, my husband could never understand when he came over to date me. And he, I lived on L Street in South Boston. And if he picked me up at Wellesley, it was one s different issue in the Victorian living room at Wellesley College. But when he came to pick me up at home, my mother would say, why don't you go down and take a sauna? Or why don't you go down and take a steam? And it would, you know, it, you know, have my washed or something. It's simply something that people did. At the end of the day, you went and took a steam. And my husband always said, the greatest thing about Southie, there's no gender gap. No gender gap and no generation gap. Everyone talks the same in the bathhouse. And the boys from age 7 to age 85 all said the same thing. How are the effing Bruins doing? How are the, I don't know how they're effing doing. How are the effing, how are the effing Rangers, I don't know how they're doing. How are the effing Celtics doing? I don't know how they're doing. Everyone, 80 year span, that's how they all say, and they have one adjective. That's it, one adjective. That's true. The cursing part is definitely, you know, that, that, that part I think is, uh, not that people curse more or less necessarily in a, um, but, uh, I don't know whether it's less colorful or just one adjective, but there's a there's that. And then grammar is a big difference. And then not wanting to start sound too la da is a big thing. In fact, I would say there are differences in Southie by parish. I would say that people in St. Bridget's Parish in City Point who had Monsignor Waters, who used to have a shillelagh and stick it in your shoulder and say, you, Conley, you're in this parish, you go home, it's 10 o'clock. Some other perfectly healthy young girl standing beside you, but she was in another parish, she could stay out after 10. You know, she was not good enough to go home when she was supposed to, right? So, yeah, I would say by parish. Towards the point, they are much more la da attempting to sound like the Kennedys. That's where Billy Bulger lives. That's where Johnny Powers lived, Louise Hicks lived. Uh, and I think we all thought that we would be politicians and, uh, wanted to sound that way in the state house. So we used to wear buttons that said there were only two kinds of people in the world, those that are Irish and those that wish they were. That kind of, it was that kind of thing. And the gate of heaven was a little more working class mixed with Italians from, uh, who worked on the fish piers and around uh, the Italian American restaurant and that sort of thing. And then you get down to the lower end and you had a little larger percentage of people in the D Street Project and people on welfare. Um, so yes, I would say very pronounced, even in that area. Yeah, you're giving me distinctions within distinctions. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. Which is sort of an interesting way that, that people in cities you know, perceive their surroundings. And I'm giving you very distinct class differences also, aren't I? They're, but they were very distinct. 
we as teenagers, I would, when South Ihai, when the issue of South Ihai being integrated um, was a joke because I didn't know anyone. I grew up in City Point. I didn't know anyone who would allow their children to go to South Ihai. All my friends went to BC or they went to Latin school or girls went to Fontbonne and we wouldn't date people who lived in the lower end, the D Street Project. And a friend would say, he lives in the D Street Project and uh, you know how he talks. And she didn't speak that well either, in the <laughs> necessarily, but had aspirations. Perhaps that's the difference. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you have to be very tough, but yeah. uh, they still break the ice. Just you gave us distinctions that's w you know within South Boston, but what about beyond South Boston? Can you? I mean, nowadays, are there sort of neighborhood accents, or you know, so are there still social class accents? Yes, or? and can I tell? Um, sometimes I can tell if someone went to parochial school in Dorchester by the way they walk, not necessarily by the way they talk, as you were those flats for so long. But yes, I think there's definitely a Dorchester accent. No question. Dorchester. No question is it Dorchester accent. And there's a South Boston accent, although it's becoming a little regentrified. Um, in terms of a Chinatown or a Roxbury accent, I don't know if I could tell you. And there's definitely a Beacon Hill accent. Francis Sargent has a Beacon Hill accent former governor sergeant. There is a um, suburban accent. People will say, and, and as a traditionalist, I get offended. People will say, I'm from Boston. You ask, where are they from? Malden, uh, Waltham, you know, something like that. And I don't know why I should get offended. I don't own the territory. And I even live in the suburbs now myself. But, and I think that there's a different sound in the suburbs. In some American cities, um, if you go to the old neighborhoods, you know, in the inner city, you know, the brick streets, brick streets, and that sort of thing, you'll hear the local accent real strongly. Okay, but then when you get out to the suburbs and the middle class, it starts to sound like they're from Ohio somewhere, even if they're not from Ohio, even if they're from Philadelphia. In Boston, does the middle class have a Bostonian or something that really says this is from Boston, this is New England? Yes, and I think it's intentional. I think the Kennedys. Uh, and Jack Kennedy in the White House and the Kennedys provided us sort of a media role model. And maybe other regions didn't have that. Um, and then Harvard um, definitely has an accent. I mean, maybe I'm so parochial I don't know th this about other universities, but I've never heard of a Stanford accent or a Rice accent. And there's a Southern accent, so you might say Tulane or Southern Methodist, but I doubt people associate. There's definitely a Harvard accent. You park the car in the Harvard yard or you don't. And if you can't say it, maybe you can't park. There's always that, that sort of, that aspiration and that climbing up. And so I think that even, that maybe people consciously um, maintain their accent. Uh, I don't know. There's some, there is some gentrification and uh, integration and uh, a lot of New Yorkers and Jersey moving up, but I think there's definitely a, uh, a Massachusetts accent. And you have one of those, would you say? I think so. I think so. I'm embarrassed and I lament that I've lost some of it. I think I had more color. I don't know if I, if I was understood as clearly, but I definitely had more color 20 years ago. Yeah. And I can't hear myself. Uh, you lose the ability to hear yourself, so you'll have to tell me. My friends say I have a Boston accent, although a very good friend who grew up with me moved to Washington, came back, I think expected to hear my Boston accent, uh, put herself in a nice warm blanket of home, uh, was offended and said I sounded like a New Yorker. I lived with a New Yorker for 16 years, so uh, I've picked up some of his accent, perhaps. But she thought that I was trying to um, be a social climber. I married a Jew, and she thinks I'm trying to move up in the social ladder, maybe. I don't know. Is that the way it's done in Boston? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> in some Jew. circles. Yeah. In some circles, there's different status. What about, what about the, uh, is there, is there an, uh, an accent that's uh, associated with sort of real upper class, proper Bostonians? No question. There's a Brahmin accent. Um, and that's associated with Harvard um, and at the sergeants. And I've always said that some of the private schools in New England, I mean, that's the best the best argument you could make for private school, and I'm an avid supporter of public school, 
is that you can take these people with mediocre minds and make them sound fabulous and everyone listens to them. Um, it's their entry card to the vault to be president of a university, to be president of a company, whatever, and they sign the thing. Sure, I, pride's crossing and absolutely, absolutely, there's a, there's a Brahmin accent. Does that work for you? The Peabody's somebody, or whatever. Does that work for you when you hear somebody with an accent like that? Are you impressed? I'm not impressed, but I, um, I stereotype them. Chester Atkins. Uh, I stereotype them. I'm, I'm not necessarily proud or not proud of that, but I hear the accent. I hear it. Uh, I've been to Wellesley, so I know that the accent does not equate to education, but I know it usually equates to power. There are a few dropouts, sort of the John Cheevers group, uh, who have been well educated and are still not, are not in a powerful circle, but that's seldom. Do you so. think there's a lot of aspiration to that accent among middle class people who aren't Peabody's or Lowell? I don't hear it. I don't hear it. Um, maybe there was while they were being educated, and then that dropped off. That could be. It could be true for all of us. And some of our professors sounded that way, and, and uh, that could be true. Can you tell us the story you told us about uh, your fortunes in Yale? Oh. Uh, so how language has affected my life? Like <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two roads diverged in Yellowwood. Uh, we were talking about language uh, being a decisive factor in your life. And uh, I was uh, engaged for a while to a Yaley who sounded like a Yaley to me, although he had a, a trace of a southern accent. I thought sort of a Bill Faulkner, Truman Capote accent. You know, it, when you're 20, you don't, you know, make these distinctions. And I went home to meet his family uh, at Christmas. And as we drove further south from New Haven, uh, his accent got heavier and heavier. Not only did his accent become more southern, uh, he was from Sparta, North Carolina. So it was the Blue Ri Hills, the Blue Ridge Mountain area. Um, it became filled with all these hillbilly kind of regionalisms, you know, this real kind of you all stuff. And as well, a lot of the, um, the hand gestures, I mean, this was, this man was becoming a different person as we went, mostly the language. By the time we got to Sparta, um, I had had it. I just knew that someone with those little accents was not going to crawl around inside of me. I was not going to have little southern babies who talked like that. And I got a plane home. No question. Now, his father thought that I could change him. And maybe even I could change him. Well, we didn't talk accent. I don't think that dawned on his father. Uh, his father could see me sort of disengaging, you know, and just uh, getting cooler and cooler, and not realizing it was the, um, the accent so much <laughs> that was making me. Maybe I just stopped understanding what they were saying after a while. Uh, it was getting so heavy. But um, I think when I thought about changing someone, I thought the last thing I could probably change would be that accent. There was no question. No question. I wanted children who um, were going to go to Harvard and be able to say it right. So I came home ended up with a New York Jew who still doesn't say it quite right, but at least he went to Harvard. It's a little, and we can see it from my yard. <laughs> Close enough. Like every town, there are several districts, several parts of town, sections of town. There's a part, in town, a part of town called Whiskey Point. Um, okay, well that, sorry, I'm going to have to stop for a second. We need to, for you to to say Brookline or something. Oh, so okay. Or I'm on the school committee in Brookline, and or Brookline, Mass, where I yeah, live. Yeah, let, let's hear. Let, hold on, what, for a second. Let's figure out the best way to, best way to, to context okay. to context this. Um, Brookline is really Brookline is a suburban community around Boston. As a suburbanite who moved from South Boston, as someone who moved from that's sure. That's right. that's right. uh, since I since I got married, um, since I plant started having children about the last uh, 13 years. I've lived in Brookline, which is the closest suburb to Boston. We're surrounded on three sides by Boston. I think sometimes we forget we don't pay taxes in Boston. Um, we certainly pay enough taxes for the trolley to go into Boston. Um, and Brookline is uh, a mixed community. 
with its mixed accents. It, there is a section of town called the Point. Uh, it is called Whiskey Point, uh, a term that I took objection to when I was on the school committee as an ethnic slur. Uh, some people said that it was because there was a distillery there, but we all know pretty much that it's the uh, stereotype of the Irish drinking. And that is um, middle, middle class to working class Irish. It's becoming more expensive to live there, and so can't predict for the next 10 years. But their accents sound very much like Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, and they're very close to that area. And it's probably still uh, fairly homogeneous Irish. There's a Chestnut Hill section of Brookline, which is um, a lot of Yankee and Brahmin families. Elliot Richardson lives in Brookline, former Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and I think he has a very Brahmin accent. Uh, and John Kennedy was born a few blocks from where we are now, here in Brookline, and was part of that Irish tradition. And, um, that particular neighborhood has changed over as a very mixed neighborhood, and we have uh, a lot of New York and New Jersey, first, second generation um, Jews in the population, and I think that has changed the accent. There is a Brookline accent, uh, Mike Dukakis, who's governor of Massachusetts, I think probably epitomizes it the best. Uh, it is an accent, I think, not quite as pronounced as Ted Kennedy, but he grew up here. It's definitely a broad A. It's definitely an R at the end, definitely an intonation. I think an intonation that makes the listener wait one minute, as if you're going to say something funny or something very intelligent or hopefully quote Emerson or Thoreau. It, it's that sort of pause. Dukakis has it and Kennedy has it, and that's what I consider a, a, a traditional Boston accent. It's a little less pronounced um, in Brookline. But if you listen to Brookline attorneys uh, who try to copy each other probably in the courts or come to town meeting in Brookline, you'll hear a Brookline accent. Uh, the, some of the Jewish population moved from uh, Blue Hill Avenue and the West End, uh, and they were educated at Latin school uh, or Boston public school system and have uh, a Boston accent, and their children have Boston accents. A large um, oriental population coming in and a very large um, mixed foreign population, 28 foreign languages spoken in the school, and that changes and homogenizes the, pop the language a little for that next generation. It's an interesting place linguistically, I think. Mostly in Brookline, we're so involved in trying to speak to our foreign speaking students and our foreign speaking population, we're not as concerned about <laughs> the accents in English as much as um, foreign languages. Do you see Bostonians hear lots of little subtle distinctions between uh, different sorts of accents and can type people? Oh, absolutely. I think Bostonians pride themselves on it. I think we love it. I think we love having a Boston accent. I used to love saying at Wellesley when someone would say, excuse me, what did you say? Or excuse me, that word has an R, and I would say, I speak the vernacular, you have an accent. Loved it. Loved it. I think we take a great pride in it. Um, I mean, I, I, sometimes I almost wish that someone would make a law banning the Boston accent, like ban the Boston, so that we would all rise up and, and re-embrace it and have classes, on, adult ed classes on the Boston accent, you know, and really work at purifying it again. Um, <coughs> my throat got dry. Okay. And I, I think they'd be well attended, those classes. <laughs> In Brooklyn, we have wait, let's, let's wait, oh, okay. Benjamin, this is Susan, and Andy, Hi. and Louie. This How is Benjamin. Okay. Working on the ice cream. Yeah. What flavor is it? Do you want to get some ice cream? Okay. okay, what is Brookline? In Brookline, we have several pockets, linguistic okay. pockets. How's okay. that? In Brookline, which is the, the suburb, you have to you explain ah, the whole block. I have to do my move again? <laughs> you don't have to do the move, but ah. no, no, you're saying in Brookline, which Brookline. is like the closest to the suburb. Brookline is the, the uh, closest suburb to Boston. We're surrounded on three sides by Boston and had an opportunity to join Boston at one time and voted not to. Uh, and there are several pockets of language in Brookline. There's the point section, uh, euphemistically known as Whiskey Point. And obvious slur on the, uh, the Irish Catholics who live there. And I think their accent is uh, very much like Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury. The grammar is good, but it's definitely an Irish Catholic accent. Um, 
there is Chestnut Hill area. Elliot Richardson lives there uh, as an example of a Brahmin accent. And I think it's uh, Milton Academy. Ted Kennedy went to Milton Academy. It's a, it's a uh, private school, preppy, uh, North Shore, but Beacon Hill accent. Uh, and they play hockey together. I don't know. They communicate. And uh, then there is a Coolidge Corner area. And a lot of Jews moved out from Blue Hill Avenue and from the West End. Many of them were educated at the Latin School in Boston or English High, Boston Public School System, and moved out to Brooklyn. They have um, a very definite Boston accent. This, of course, is all integrated and mixed with um, New Jersey and New Yorkers, um, large Jewish population who have moved in. Is there a lot of interaction with other, between Brookline and other entities in the Boston area? I mean, like South End in Brooklyn or the North Shore in Brooklyn? You know, is, uh, in terms part, of well, part of, part of I think you know dialect has to do with who you associate with. Okay, and I'm wondering, is there a lot of interaction with you? Yeah, well, we're not an isolated community. I mean, most of the people who live in Brookline work uh, in downtown Boston. Um, so I would say, in terms of that, they're city people. Um, it's not, um, it's not a community that has one sister city and one sister community. Um, my guess is most of the communication is up. Transportation is up. They go from, from Brookline to a museum or to a university or into the city. Not too much um, of Brookline going in to eat at Bob the Chef's, which is the best rib place in Boston, but it's in Roxbury. So in that sense, it's an affluent community. Um, that's the exchange. What about from when you, when you were growing up in South Boston? Do people in South Boston get out of South Boston very much? Yeah, well my mother always said the best thing about growing up in South is it took a dime to get out. Um, perhaps less so. Or if they do get out of South Boston, and it's a lot different than, than um, when I was growing up, um, they would be going to another working class community. When I was growing up, my father walked from my house to the firehouse. Uh, we didn't have a car until I was 14. Uh, and all the recreation is right on the beach. People walk two or three blocks to either the L Street bathhouse or to the yacht clubs. We belong to a yacht club. My father was a firefighter and we belong to a yacht club and we had an outboard motor. Um, the McCormicks belonged to the same yacht club, uh, but it was not a ritzy yacht club. Um, and so your summer recreation is there and you just go as far as in town. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of mobility when we were growing up. And of course, once we opened our mouths of saying Southie is my hometown, you know, people would make a little distance around it. <laughs> Actually, that happened to me at the Parker House on a New Year's Eve once. My brother and I and two of our friends were a quartet, and we sang for about an hour. It seemed like an hour. We sang, and we were getting a lot of attention. Every time between sets of the orchestra, we would get up and sing. And we sang all the oldies, and every, people were applauding. We were doing well until we sang Southie is my hometown when all these people who must have driven into the Parker House from Newton realized we were f where we were from, at least originally. We got booed. Everyone ignored us. <laughs> we, just, we had to sit down, get in the back row. What is, why is Southie? What's the connotation there? Oh, I think ever since the busing situation, it's really uh, gotten a bad reputation. Uh, although it, South Boston never had a particularly good reputation <laughs> outside of South Boston. <laughs> Um, I remember when South Boston High was integrated. We just, I mean, no one would, no one in South Boston would ever have thought of going to South Boston High if you had an option. You'd go to BC High, you'd go to Latin School, you'd be somewhere else. But what is, I mean, integration aside, since that's a very thorny issue, I mean, before all that happened, what was, the, what did it mean to be from South Boston to, to the rest of the city? If, um, uh, if you wanted credit at a store and your address was South Boston, it might be a little harder um, because you were thought to be poor. Um, sometimes people from, well, people from Charlestown or East Boston would say, oh, you're pretty close over there. There were a couple of very tough gangs in South Boston in the 30s, the Drippin Daggers, you know, the Gustin Gang. We're talking about crime, uh, you know, 
I can remember my mother crying because her bookie was shot in the street. You know, I mean, it's not something. I got the phone call. I was teaching in New York, and I had tears in my eyes. And my husband said, "What's wrong?" And I said, "My mother's bookie was shot." And it wasn't until he laughed that I realized that this would be seen as unusual someplace else. That my mother going to her bookie, unfortunately, and and not even to make light of it, two more people were just killed recently in South Boston. That was um, part. Of, and there's a stand-up comic in. Um, in Boston now who does a routine to steal his line and he says you know I grew up in Charlestown I'm almost 40 my friends are dead and that's in Southie that was true it was a tough a very tough street life um, I think it was a, a safe enough neighborhood I always felt safe growing up there because everyone knew who we were but I think people from the outside were always afraid of it and maybe rightly so I remember my mother having hubcaps stolen on a brand new car and she went down to the corner store and said my hubcaps were stolen. She had parked the car at 6. And someone rang the doorbell at 11 and said, hey, hey, Mrs. C, I'm really sorry. I didn't know they were your car. It was your car. You should have told us. You've got to tell us when you buy a new car. <laughs> and she, you know, by the, and my, and my mother said, she said, it's the 6 o'clock news. By the 11 o'clock news, I'll have my, you know, I'll have my hubcaps back if, if it was a local, as if it could not be a local. It, it, uh, who comes into so, that? Right, to steal right. Food? So I think, you know, there's that. Um, a, a tight, we're a tight community. Um, watch out for our own. That kind of, that kind of attitude. So uh, that's probably a reputation. A million a year, and we just achieve boring. That's right. That's what it is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> sort of the way I feel about Sweden. Yes, <laughs> down on them, make fun of them. <laughs> yeah, well, no, of course, center, center. not too many people remember that James Conley, the first Olympic gold medal winner was from South Boston, or Richard Cardinal Cushing was from South Boston. Not too many people remember that. They remember people lining the streets and throwing rocks through bus windows. You know, you, you remember what's, you know, what's um, exciting or negative or in the media. Does Brookline have that problem at all? Well, we have one columnist in the Boston Globe, Mike Barnacle, who occasionally makes fun of us for uh, being somewhat left of Whoopi and voting for Barney Frank, you know, that kind of. I suppose we have a, um, a moniker, but that is being liberal and uh, you know, sort of a democratic uh, intellectual sort of uh, haven, if you will, sort of the liberals' liberal town. Do you think Brookline feels, uh, and we're talking in very strange terms here, but do you think that they they aspire, you know, Brookline would aspire to be another sort of community. Are they jealous or envious or people say, oh, well, we live in Brookline, but if we lived in Newton, it would, things would be better. No, I think most people think that they died and went to heaven or died and went to Disneyland. Um, in Tel Aviv, they have signs that say devotion school, Brookline. We have the highest concentration of college presidents in the state, of judges in the state, of directors of volunteers in the state. Um, People will tell you how many foreign languages are spoken in the, for in the public schools here, about how liberal we are, 82% for Barney Frank. People in Brookline call their representatives by their first name. When our senator ran for re-election, Jack Backman, our, to our state legislature, the bumper stickers simply said, Jack. People, when they talk about Michael, they don't mean Michael Rowe, the voter show, they mean Michael Dukakis, governor. Everyone says, Michael. All the women over 60 in Brookline walk around as if they gave birth to Michael. Um, and Barney is Barney. I mean, he's the only Barney in Congress. You know. But, but people, people love that. People are extremely political. They're very democratic or pride themselves on being democratic with a small d. Um, and uh, I think that we identify very much with ourselves as a community. How do you think the people in Brookline, with all its diversity, feel about the North Shore, the Brahmin, sort of Brahmin horsey country? Well, I think there are some people in Brookline who could afford to live in the North Shore and choose to live uh, in the city. Um, I think you might hear uh, a few jokes about the North Shore. Most of them would be political about them being Republicans. You have sort of the civil libertarians here in Brookline, people who lead the battle on capital punishment. Um, most people are in Brookline because they want to be. Uh, and that makes it a good community to live in. They pride themselves on education. Um, and so I don't think they think of the North Shore as being more powerful. That's what makes Brookline different. I think that power is not money in Brookline. Power is politics in Brookline. 
and um, that makes a different community. You can walk into a house where people are all in sweaters and there are Cheerios under the radiator and you sit in furniture that's not elegant uh, and someone who is a candidate for President of the United States may be coming because this is where the Democratic Party is and some powerful people and um, okay. this is where things start nationally. Often. Yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at there is we go to, uh, we went to East Boston uh, and asked some people about, well, what do you think about the people on, on Beacon Hill? And they went, oh, they're a bunch of snobs, you know, they get, you know, they get putting on ears. And there's that attitude towards, towards the upper classes. How do you think, the, the, what I, you know, the sort of middle class, upper middle class area here, wh what do you think their perceptions are of that sort of drama and old money? Uh, which is very much a part of Boston society, after all. Um, I don't think they envy it. Uh, my guess is, if anything, people in Brookline are in a position, many of them have been educated with Brahmins uh, and have outdistanced them somewhat, um, or sometimes. I think um, it's not envy. I think there might be a satire of the stereotype. But um, but not envy. It might be the way the University of Chicago looks east uh, at the Ivy League. Um, they kn you know the University of Chicago knows what it is. It's very intellectual. It's very young and open and doing. And it looks at the establishment as kind of stuffy. And I think Brookline's not stuffy, and thinks of itself as very intellectual. So I don't see much envy for that. Would people in Brooklyn like more money? Sure. Would people in Brooklyn spend it the same way? No. We have bar mitzvahs here. They don't do that in the Brahmin area. You know, we like a little nouveau riche. You know, we feel that bartenders have to earn a living too. Uh, you know, people in Brooklyn are, are good tippers. They're good party givers. Uh, people don't think anything of having 40 or 50 people in their house for a political party. Um, that's, a, that's a different style. Mike Dukak is riding the trolley and wearing a sweater is Brookline style. Oh, I don't know. Don't like. I suppose I, I would be upset to hear my, my kids talking like Dorchester. You know, well, uh, St. Ambrose in Dorchester, not St. Gregory's in Dorchester, a little different, you know, that w I wouldn't be thrilled about that in terms of clarity, but there's something that warms my heart in terms of just being nostalgic <laughs> about hearing old neighborhood accents. So I suppose I couldn't say that. Something that I find creeping into Boston accents, and whether it's media or whether it's self-consciousness or what, I find a lot of my friends, middle-class Bostonians, aggravating R's. They add R's everywhere because people have told them somewhere along the line that they've dropped R's. So I find fairly intelligent people who went to BC all of a sudden using lots of R's and saying horn and park and that kind of thing. So that is disconsonant to the ear. Um, but no, there's nothing that I that I can't deal with. It's not like parts of New Jersey, where you think that, you know, perhaps it should be cut off and set afloat. <laughs> they're, not, they're not born to the tongue, that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or certain parts of the Midwest, where you think these people couldn't possibly read Milton and Shelley and Shakespeare and, and be thinking it in that accent. <laughs> I don't think of that in terms of that. Why does Shakespeare sound like in the Midwest that's accent? What I, that's know? a good question. <laughs> how, I think that's a great project. We'll fly out and have someone from Indiana read Shakespeare. But I suppose the Prairie Home Companion, he always does a sonnet at the end or something. He would. Well, of course, it can go the other way around. There's the Longfellow poem about uh, listen, my children, and you shall hear. The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, yeah. But how would, how would someone in Southie say that? I don't know. He would. Maybe someone from Southie would know that it was actually William Dawes who made the ride. <laughs> Listen, my children, you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. That, that was one, you know, just thinking of that, that double syllable. I suppose that it, when people make Revere, 
making two syllables out of it. That's something that's somewhat offensive. And my daughter was named Molly Elizabeth instead of after my mother. My mother's name is Claire. But my husband said her name would never be Claire, it would be Clea. Everyone calls your mother Clea. And so we're not naming the kid Clea, we're naming her Elizabeth. So that's sort of. <laughs> you don't have any syllables. Good exactly. Start, exactly. Yeah. Okay. How do they talk in Southie? Three nine Jordan Road. I won't tell you what you wrote. Well, all right. 